In Chinese opera, there is a special group of people known as Piaoyu, or opera fans. It's said that the word Piaoyu comes from the Qing Dynasty. The term refers to amateur performers and musicians. When an amateur becomes a professional, there is another term for the practice, Xiao Hai, literally meaning go into the sea. Where there are operas, there are amateur performers. Peking opera amateur performers are the most active, and many of them are quite good. They are proud of their ability to perform in the vocal style of the Cheng School of Peking Opera, because it's the most beautiful, but it is also the hardest to master. It was created by Cheng Yang Cho. His voice is described as touching and sweet sounding. His innovative style of singing is believed by some to have the power to influence people's minds. Today, Shaosheng Feng Alley is a tourist attraction in Beijing, but during the Qing Dynasty, it was a territory of the Plain Yellow Banner, an imperial Manchu army. Cheng Yanshou was born here in 1904 with a Manchurian name, Sokoro Cheng Lin. Cheng Yanshou's forefather followed Prince Regent Aisin Jioro Dorgon in his conquest of China and was knighted because of it. Cheng Yanshou's father, Rong Shou, inherited his knighthood. Life in Beijing was precarious during the early 20th century, yet tea houses and theaters beyond the South City Gate were flourishing. Here, Peking Opera was enjoying its golden age. Every evening, people went by carriage from the city center to the famous theaters. Chung Lin's mother was one of them. Less than one year old, Chung Lin often fell asleep in his mother's arms, listening to the operas. No one would have thought that this child from a noble family would spend his life on stage. In 1905, when Chung Lin was one year old, his father died. The family, having lost its foundation, gradually declined in the turbulence surrounding the late Qing dynasty. His mother started looking for a way to support the family. When Cheng Lin was six, a neighbor, a Hua Lian, a performer of a classical male opera role with a painted face, made a suggestion to his mother, send the child to learn Peking opera. As a former aristocrat, it was certainly very difficult for Cheng Lin to decide to earn his living as a humble entertainer. Although ordinary Chinese opera performers had low social status, a famous actor could earn a fortune. In the late Qing Dynasty, Master Tan Xinpei might earn 50 silver tails for one performance, while the salary of a highest-ranking government minister was only 180 silver tails per year. Many years later, Zheng Yanshou wrote in his memoir, my family was so poor that if I agreed to be an apprentice, my mother would have fewer burdens. So I agreed without hesitation. With no intent to pursue a dream of art or an ambition to make a career, Zheng Yanshou started to learn Chinese opera, learning a skill to support his family.
Later, Chung Yen Sho described his training in his memoir. On the first day of my apprenticeship, I began to practice, sitting on the ground, back against the wall, legs apart, and trying to keep my knees unbent. I used two flower pots to keep my legs open. The goal is to do the splits so that my body and my legs are in a straight line. Sometimes I was so hungry in the morning that I would eat something secretly before practice began. But when I bent forward and my teacher held my back, I would throw up my breakfast and face punishment. The teacher often said, if you bend backwards with a full stomach, your intestines will break. Apart from training, the apprentices also helped with cooking, cleaning, and errands. Cheng Lin gained solid basic skills and a firm and tenacious character under the strict tutelage. However, family misfortunes and a difficult childhood also made him shy, sensitive, and somewhat depressed. Beneath the young boy's handsome face, unique temperament, and perfect voice, Rong Die Xin saw his potential to become a famous Dan performer, a female lead role in Peking Opera. At seven years old, Cheng Lin began to embark on the road to become a century master. The Dong'an Market in Beijing has been bustling for more than 100 years. A century ago, Beijing's famous Dan Gui Theater was located here. One day in 1915, a young Dan performer made his debut in the Dan Gui Theater. 11-year-old Cheng Lin was to warm up the audience for him. The Manchurian named Socorro Chung Lin was not considered suitable in theatrical circles, so the young man had his first stage name, Chung Junong. Chung Junong's premiere was a huge success. The next day, most theatrical fans talked about him instead of the leading actor. People said he had a pretty look and a wonderful voice. Some senior theater goers predicted he would become a famous Dan artist, like Mei Lan Feng. Seeing his apprentice so popular among the audience, his teacher, Rong Die Xin, arranged more and more performances for him. Cheng Junong often had to perform from afternoon till evening. His fame soared with frequent stage appearances. Soon, Cheng Junong was very popular in Beijing. A theater fan wrote a poem to Cheng Junong to express his appreciation for him. He said, Cheng Junong's wonderful voice and elegant demeanor were as good as those of Mei Lan Feng, one of the brightest stars in theatrical circles. The name of this theater fan was Luo Ying Gong. Luo Ying Gong was 32 years older than Cheng Junong. He once served as General Yuan Shikai's secretary and as a member of the state council. Due to his discontent over the restoration of the monarchy, Luo Ying Gong quit his political career and became a scholar. Luo Ying Gong was a good friend to many famous Chinese opera performers, such as Wang Yaoqing and Mei Lan Feng. He loved art and was active in funding and writing operas. He would become the most important person in Cheng Junong's artistic career and life. To become a master, one needs to have both natural talent and the favor of fate.
Loa Ying Gong knew that without academic knowledge, one could not become a creative artist. He personally taught Cheng Yan Shou poetry and calligraphy. To improve his artistic training, Loa Ying Gong regularly took Cheng Yan Shou to watch films. As Cheng Yan Shou concentrated on learning, fate played a cruel joke on him. Due to overwork, Cheng Ju Nong's voice cracked in 1917, when he was only 13, far sooner than usual. Cheng Yan Shou was in a panic, as he seemed to have developed a ghost voice. This Neither Cheng Yan Shou nor Loa Ying Gong was willing to give in to despair. But who can show Cheng Yan Shou a way out of this crisis? Loa Ying Gong thought of the legendary Wang Yao Qing. Wang Yao Qing was born into a family of opera artists with exceptional natural talents. He laid down a solid foundation for the development of Dan performances. He was also a great teacher who was able to vary his classes according to students' aptitude. Chinese-speaking opera is different from Western operas in terms of voice. First of all, there are no voice parts in Peking opera, at least not in the Western sense. Instead, it has different types of roles, namely shun, a young man, Dun, a young unmarried woman, Jing, a bombastic middle-aged man, and Cho, a white-nosed jester. The vocal element of Peking opera is based on written lines, so it requires clear pronunciation, and the notes should follow the inherent tones of the Chinese characters. Western operas, on the other hand, are based on melody, and the tone of the words is determined by the musical notes. Both Peking opera and Western opera emphasize the importance of breath control. Peking opera pays attention to abdominal breathing, while Western opera focuses on coordinated breathing involving both the abdomen and the chest. Another major difference is the use of the falsetto style of singing. Falsetto is never used in Western operas. In Peking opera, however, actors portraying females and young males all sing in falsetto. After two to three years' practice, they finally found a method to produce sound using his breath rather than throat. Cheng Yan Shou invented the unique Cheng style of singing. To a Dan performer, the changes and misfortunes Cheng Yan Shou experienced could mean the end of an artistic career. However, with his extraordinary willpower, uncommon talents, and the help of many masters, 
Chung Yen Sho managed to turn a crisis into an opportunity and carve out a special road to mastership. Over the past century, many artistic styles of Peking opera appeared, but there were only a few of them known for their style of singing. Over half of Beijing's theaters used to be located near the Zhongyong Gate. The Zhonghua Theater has a history of over 200 years. Its former door plate still remains today. In February 1922, Zheng Yanshou returned to the stage there with his new style of singing. At this time, with the help of Luo Ying Gong, he had founded his own troupe, the Hua Sheng Troupe. The Hua Sheng Troupe's debut caused great sensation. They performed repeated encores. In spring and autumn of that year, 18-year-old Cheng Yen Shou performed the lead role in Beijing and Shanghai and soon made a name for himself. It's generally believed that after his performances in Beijing and Shanghai in 1922, Cheng Yen Shou's style of singing began to take root in people's hearts. In 1925, the role of Dan performers in Peking Opera was rising quickly. Mei Lan Feng, Cheng Yen Shou, Sheng Xiao Yun staged a number of new operas and created their own representative styles. People used to say that Mei Lan Feng was as gentle and lovely as a lady. Sheng Xiao Yun was as charming as a prince. And Cheng Yen Shou was more like a scholar. Cheng Yen Shou obtained this scholarly temperament because he had been taught by his mentor, Luo Yin Gong, for so many years. Some people said although he was in his early 20s, he had demonstrated maturity, rarely seen in his peers. Cheng Yen Shou often responded to these comments with a silent smile. When he was alone, the pain and regret in his heart never ceased. In September 1924, his mentor, Luo Ying Gong, died of overwork. Cheng Yen Shou had just turned 20. The death of Luo Ying Gong was a heavy blow. Luo Ying Gong not only gave him a second chance in art, but elevated his artistic accomplishments as well. Luo Ying Gong was also the planner responsible for all of Cheng Yen Shou's new operas. Would Chung retire from the theater or hold on alone? After some thought, Chung Yen Shou decided to write and stage new operas by himself. At the age of 20, he told his new wife, Guo Su Ying, it's time to start all over again. This much-loved record was made by the Great Wall Record Company in June 1931. It's an aria from the Peking opera Four Five Flower Cave, sung by Mei Lan Feng, Cheng Xiao Yun, Cheng Yan Shou, and Xun Hoi Sheng. It was a big hit at the time. In 1930, a vote by readers of Shanghai's Theater Monthly honored Mei Lan Feng, Cheng Xiao Yun, Cheng Yan Shou, and Xun Hoi Sheng 
as the four famous stands in Peking Opera. They had their own different styles. Mei Lan Feng was elegant, full of the charisma of a king. Sheng Xiao Yun was more masculine. He often played female generals. Shun Hoi Sheng was lively. He played lovely and joyous ladies. Chang Yen Shou was 26, the youngest. He had a unique style of singing and an exquisite manner in his performance. In the vote, he sometimes even outscored Mei Lan Feng, who was 10 years older than him. Young people in China today call beautiful women goddesses. Unaware of the fascinating goddesses once portrayed by Mei Lan Feng, Shan Xiaoyun, Cheng Yang Cho, and Sun Wei Shen, who were actually men. The only similar art may be Japanese kabuki, in which the female parts are all played by men with heavy makeup, traditional costumes, and headgear, all to celebrate the ancient beauty of Japanese women. However, kabuki is simpler than Peking opera, as singing and dancing are only a small part of the performance. Peking opera performers sing and dance constantly, as well as occasionally perform fierce fight routines and difficult somersaults. In January and August 1931, Cheng Yen Shou staged and performed two tragic works, Tears of Wasted Mountain and The Dream of a Lady, to express heartache over the unjust wars taking place in China. People lived in misery during this national crisis. Cheng Yen Shou closely linked his artist creation with the nation's destiny. With smooth melodies and realistic plots, Cheng's operas soon swept the country. So in the 1930s, many new ideas were introduced into China. They offered new inspiration to the people. Although society became more open, the Chinese theatrical world was very conservative. Peking opera was still deemed as a mere pastime, and Peking opera artists held low social status. Cheng Yen Shou wanted to be more than just an entertainer for dignitaries. He had a profound understanding of Peking opera's current situation, as well as the changing times. January 1st, 1932, was Cheng Yen Shou's 28th birthday. Instead of having a birthday party, Cheng Yen Shou announced that he was going to change his stage name to another Yen Shou. The new name means inkstone in Chinese. He wished that he would become as hardened as a piece of inkstone. It demonstrated his self-esteem and view of himself. This is the way he responded to social prejudice. Three days later, Cheng Yen Shou's letter to colleagues in the Chinese opera circle was released in the Chinese Opera Monthly, in which he announced that he would stop all performances and would be going to Europe to study at his own expense. This film was made on the afternoon of January 13, 1932, when Cheng Yen Shou set off from Beijing to Europe as the vice director 
of the National Conservatory's Nanjing branch. Many of his friends came to see him off. Before he left, Cheng Yen Shou talked with many of these friends in his house in Beijing. He said to his colleagues, I'm going to visit Europe to learn from Western drama and opera, to improve Chinese opera. With kind blessings and farewells, Zheng Yen Shou began his journey to the West. Famous French physicist Paul Longvin traveled with him. Paul Longvin became a friend of Zheng Yen Shou because he had seen Zheng Yen Shou's Tears of Wasted Mountain before he visited Beijing. From January 1932 until March 1933, Chiang Yen-shou traveled to what was then the Soviet Union, France, Britain, Germany, Italy, and many other countries. With the help and recommendation of Long Ben, Chiang Yen-shou managed to visit various kinds of drama academies and theaters and watch different forms of Western drama. In 1933 Europe, Hitler had just come to power. A war was looming. In Paris and Berlin, Cheng Yen Shou watched many anti-war plays. He was amazed and inspired by their use of stage light and design, the well-structured theaters and backstage, the advanced teaching methods and strong artistic atmosphere. In Hochschule für Musik Berlin, strengthened his determination to reform Chinese opera education. While he studied abroad, Cheng Yen Shou was happy and content. In one of his articles, Cheng Yen Shou wrote, I have never lived in this way. These are the best memories of my life.在跑考察报告中他提到了对于中国戏曲改革的十九项建议其中八项今天已经完成了原来都是六点开戏十二点钟散戏甚至到一点观众也累后台演员也累三三年回来以后成先人都改了开始就主戏七点钟到十一点这
Liu Xinran is a Dan performer, an apprentice of Ma Uchi. Liu Xinran is also an artist of the Cheng Yen Show School of Performance. He often rehearses and performs here. In 2016, he was rehearsing classical Chinese operas that have not been staged for years. After that, he went on a national tour to present both his new operas and classical operatic works. Liu Xinran has come to visit his friend, fashion designer Wang Wu Tao, to ask for Wang's opinions on his new costumes. Xiang 银丝来去做了一个勾线这是盘银绣让整个花朵呈现的更加的立体最传统的东西梅先生跟程先生可长是starring Chua Shao Cho, a student of Cheng Yen Show. Tang honored as the inheritor of the Cheng Yen Show School of Peking Opera Performance. Chua Xiaochuo is one of the leading contemporary Chinese opera artists. She and her team are exploring the use of Western orchestral instruments in the accompaniment of traditional Peking opera. From Chua Xiaochuo's point of view, it's another inheritance from the Cheng Yen Show School of Peking Opera Performance. 随着时代的发展，我觉得大师如果说他要现在还在，他也一定会往前走。The Sung Sisters gained very positive responses. Chua Shao Chou's experiment won recognition from the audience and the market. While feeling happy about her experiments, Chua Shao Chou often asks herself questions: Did I interpret it well? If Master Chung was here, would he agree with my interpretations? What are the qualities of the Cheng Yen Show School of Peking Opera Performance that have amazed later generations?
Chang Yen Sho's representative work, The Lucky Purse, was written in 1939. In his 30s, he had accumulated rich experience in tunes and ways of singing. He was known for his unique characters and elegant demeanor in the field of Peking opera. He had traveled to Europe, broadened his horizon in the world of art, and gained much inspiration. He was on the way to the peak of his artistic career. In many Peking opera experts' minds, Zheng Yan Shou was good at playing tragedies, but this didn't mean he was also good at playing comedies. Zheng Yan Shou asked the scriptwriter, Wang Ao Hong, to break through this old practice and introduce the rhythm of literary language into Peking opera lyrics. For the first time in the history of Peking opera, both long sentences and short sentences are used in lyrics of the lucky purse. In accordance with the lyrics, Zheng Yan Shou also created a new tempo of singing which matches both the plot and characters' personalities. Zheng Yan Shou's musical talent and capabilities are fully revealed in the lucky purse. This is the Chinese Children's Theater in Beijing, formerly known as the Jin Guang Cinema. 80 years ago, it was one of the best cinemas in Beijing. While staging The Lucky Purse, Zhang Yan Shou and his apprentice, Liu Ying Chou, came to the Jin Guang Cinema to watch the American movie The Love Parade. When he heard Jeanette McDonald singing a coloratura soprano aria, Zhang Yan Shou was deeply drawn by it. He said to Liu Ying Chou, it is so melodious. After that, Cheng Yin Chou introduced singing skills of the coloratura soprano into Peking opera and designed a special aria at the end of the lucky purse. In line with his specially designed arias, Cheng Yin Chou asked imperial luthier Zhou Cheng Hua to design a hu chin, a two-stringed bowed instrument with a unique timber for him. This hu chin was only used to accompany Cheng Yan Shou's arias. When Cheng Yan Shou choreographed how performers move with their long water sleeves, long sleeves in classical operas or dances, he incorporated some movements from Tai Chi, a kind of traditional Chinese shadow boxing. The Water Sleeves Dance in the Lucky Purse is still considered a representative work in Peking opera. In April 1940, The Lucky Purse premiered in the Gold Theater in Shanghai and caused a great sensation. After it had been performed 10 times, the audience called for another 10 performances, and it still had a full house every time. Sometimes when Chung Yan Shou was singing, the audience would sing with him this had never happened before. Some people say the most valuable quality about the Lucky Purse is that it's full of genuine emotions and beauty while preserving traditional Peking opera techniques and procedures. Everyone in China knows that Chen Yangcho went to Europe to learn the skills of Western opera. But most don't know that he learned from many Chinese local operas too, transplanting their singing techniques to his performances. His methods were similar to the formation of Peking opera itself. 200 years ago, the famous four opera troops from Anhui province arrived in Beijing and merged their form of opera with the Kun Shui Opera and the Qin Chang Opera and other local styles. They also adopted the linguistic features of the Beijing dialect. About 60 years later, Peking Opera was born. In September 1949, Zheng Yanshou, as a representative of Chinese opera, attended the first session of the National Political Consultative Conference At the end of 1950, 
in the National Opera Work Conference. Then Premier Zhou Enlai shook hands with every participant and justified the social status of Chinese opera artists. Thereafter, Cheng Yanshou was elected deputy to the National People's Congress and became vice director of the Chinese Opera Research Institute. From a noble descendant in the late Qing Dynasty, to a new opera performer, Cheng Zhu Nong, the famous Master Cheng, and then a well-respected opera artist who was able to participate in the country's political decisions. It was far beyond Cheng Yanshou's expectation. He had never felt more respected. He genuinely loved the new regime, society, and the changes happening around him. The audience's applause now had a totally different meaning to him. In 1957, recommended by then Premier Zhou Enlai and General Hua Long, Cheng Yanshou joined the Communist Party of China. At the same time, reforms were taking place in Chinese opera circles. In order to adapt to the ongoing social development and research based upon various kinds of Chinese opera, the old troop system was abandoned. In this process, some traditional operas were banned because they were considered inconsistent with the spirit of the time. Cheng Yanshou still actively worked on the reform measures. In his view, this was what he had been hoping to do over the years, to improve Peking opera so that it could play an even more positive role in society. Compared with his peers, Cheng Yanshou had a more in-depth understanding of the artistic creation and significance of Peking opera. He summarized years of experience in Peking opera performance, innovation and reform into articles and books. <laughs> Cheng Yanshou's concerns and contributions are not confined to Peking opera. Around 1950, he visited senior Chinese opera artists in northwest China and southwest China, collected materials of the Shanxi opera and 12 Muquam, a representative form of Uyghur Muquam, which contains 12 pieces of divertimento, and worked out a plan for a national opera survey. Sixty years have passed. The five proposals of Cheng Yanshou have all been accomplished. Cheng Yanshou combined his love for the country with his love of art. He participated in the construction and planning of his country. This is what makes him stand out from the common people of his generation. After the Spring Festival in 1958, Cheng Yanshou was making preparations to visit France with a national opera troupe as an artistic consultant. In March, at the age of 54, he was admitted to the hospital after a heart attack brought on by overwork. In the afternoon of March 9th, Cheng Yanshou had another heart attack. The master of Peking opera died eight minutes later. After efforts of resuscitation failed, September 2015, 
Zhang Huading, inheritor of the Cheng Yen Show School of Peking Opera Performance, brought the lucky purse to New York's Lincoln Center.像这样一出戏五十年以后一百年以后两百年以后都会继续参下去这样的话呢, Chua Shao Cho is an easygoing person, but she is very strict in classes. Huang Jiaoxin is familiar with the theories. Now he knows how difficult it is in practice. Chengyuan用自己特殊的一条嗓子扮演了一些特别栩栩柔声的人物。Chengyuan是一个为京剧艺术创造了新经典的一个伟大的艺术家。As a master of art, Cheng Yen shows artistic gifts, ideas, and life beliefs have been admired and followed by later generations across time and distance. If we say Mei Lan Fan was the first to take Peking opera abroad, then it was Cheng Yang Cho who brought elements of Western art to China, using them to enrich the beauty of Peking opera in terms of music and choreography. He achieved this breakthrough despite many hardships, finally becoming a master of the art form. During his life, he designed and performed in 108 operas, most of which influenced later performance of Peking opera. His style of art and concept of invention were consistent with his faith, all of which have passed the test of time and stand as an ideal model for his successors. <laughs>